Hello and welcome to episode one of the Motor GP Extra podcast. I'm Dylan and joining me for in-depth analysis is Reese from Biker Gaming. We will be covering all three classes in this podcast, starting off with the lightweight class Moto 3. So Reese, in Moto 3, the weekend really kicked off with a bang in qualifying, some serious madness going on at the end of Q2. How did that affect Sunday's race? Well, had a huge impact on it, really, because three of the title favourites, in a way, Foggia, Suzuki and Guevara, all had to start from the back of the grid, and then they all had to serve long lap penalties. Foggia actually had to serve two. And to be honest, the penalties given out seemed a little bit strange, because a few different incidents happened during qualifying. There was the cruising coming out of the pits, which Foggia, Suzuki and Guevara all were playing a part in, which is why they all got penalties. But then, coming up towards the line on the final lap, Fodger was weaving from side to side across the track trying to break the slipstream, which is extremely dangerous. We've seen we've seen that end badly many times, most recently back in Austin last year. And he was only given the long lap penalty for that, and the back of the grid start was for the cruising out of the pit lane, which was still obviously really bad, but it's not I don't think that's as bad as weaving. So it kind of seems like they got their penalties mixed up. And to be honest, I don't think the penalties were really severe enough because Fodger and Guevara both ended up finishing in fairly decent positions still when really if you're doing something that dangerous it it needs to be zero points like it needs to be a penalty that stops you from scoring or you're just banned completely because Dennis Onchu was banned for two races for doing that last year so they need to be a little bit more consistent I think. Yeah I agree definitely with the Fodger. Uh, so Silvan Gintoli mentioned during the BT broadcast that the penalties were backwards so he got penalised for the the mean the Mr. Minor or the mean the, the smaller of the penalties he was sent to the back of the grid for. So it's just it's a bit strange. You think run one, new season. Unfortunately we had a rider lose his life last year. We had a huge accident in Texas, which as you mentioned, aren't you getting a race ban, even though he wasn't the worst of them last year. There were people that were worse, believe it or not. So you thought this was a clean slate now. They've made the little adjustment to the age of the categories and going forward it looks like they have some something set in place to kind of hopefully improve the safety of sport and rider responsibility in the race needs to be improved as well. That's down to the riders, but they need to be penalised in the right way. And unfortunately, they're already after dropping the ball race, qualifying one or qualifying two technically, but the first qualifying of the season and they've already a black mark next to race direction from not controlling the situation. I think they had to give him back the grid for what he did in qualifying, that's fair. But to say, oh, he's at the back of the grid because he came out and got in people's way, that's, it was wrong. They need, it was the, the weaving was the big issue. Come out and the, get in someone's way is deserving a penalty because it is dangerous, but it's more affecting other people's laps and stuff like that. And it's a, a smaller penalty, lesser crime. But weaving as he did, if anyone hasn't seen it, please go check it out. It'll be definitely on all over the, Motor GP socials, but he weaved twice, and there was a group of close to ten riders, and a couple of them did get penalised, and it's it's just scary. And hopefully, we keep saying this, but hopefully they just they snap down on this because this can't go on any longer like it is. Yeah, I completely agree. It's just it's absolutely ridiculous because it's just it's just so dangerous, and obviously, like we said, we've seen the the outcome of it. It's turned badly. I mean, some of the riders behind Fodger, I think, had to get out of the throttle on the straight, so. Yeah, like you said, if you haven't seen it, definitely go look at it. It's definitely on the GP socials and things like that, and it's just absolutely terrible. But whilst we're talking about irresponsible riding, there was a little bit of uh, irresponsible riding during the race. What did you seem to think to that, Dylan? So, unfortunately, <laughs> Saturday was only the beginning. Um, we, we all can hope for the race that did improve, but the race was just as bad. So there was... Again, inconsistency with penalties. So, unfortunately, Carlos Tata was taken out by Sergio Garcia. He got a long laugh for that. But with the Motor 3 class, it's no Garcia, in fairness, I've got to give him credit. He absolutely nailed his long lap. And it definitely was under three seconds. Usually, the penalty is supposed to be three seconds. But as we've seen Zach in the past, we've seen now with Garcia, if you are confident and you nail it, you can do it in lesser of a penalty. So, it's kind of a... a penalty that you can it's not three seconds at the end of the race you can actually kind of cut time out of your penalty which is quite interesting if they nail it right but he got a penalty for an aggressive move took a rider out i've no issue with that but then further into the race joma messia was taken out by kaita toba in the turn 14 15 complex 
he just kind of ran him wide and just tagged his bar, took him out. Now, it, was, it wasn't as bad as Garcia, but there were still issues with it. And I don't see the the big issue for me is I don't see why. Don't, like I don't. They might have investigated, but they didn't come back to a penalty. But he was clearly taken out. It was a clear penalty. It was someone else's fault. Messia. At, when I first watched it, I thought Messia just had a really strange cast. But when you watch it back, he has nothing done, nothing wrong. He completely gets his handlebars swiped, and he's just a, a guilty. He's a, just guilty, hundred percent to Kaito Toba. So unfortunately, that's two X's already against race direction, and. We're only at the evening of race one, so going into the tighter tracks like Haret, Le Mans and stuff like that, it's going to be hectic and they need to sort this out, but we've been saying it for months and years and unfortunately we still have these issues. Yeah, it, it seems like race direction are just never going to learn. It's just it's absolutely ridiculous. Like, I fully agree with what you were saying there. Uh, the, the long that penalty, more than fair for Sergio Garcia, that's sort of been the penalty that's been given in the past. If you Think back to other collisions like Remy Gardner with um, was it Chantra back in Misano when he took him out. He got a long lap penalty. It's kind of the it's the general penalty when you've knocked somebody else off. But Toba didn't get anything at all, not even a warning. So it's just a little bit weird because yeah, it was probably a bit more airing towards a racing incident because it was just him sort of tagging a handlebar. But even still, he was not he was the aggressor in that instance. He should have made sure the pass that he completed was clean. So. Yeah, he probably should have been given some sort of penalty for that, in my opinion. Moving on to the race, we have to, unfortunately, start with Ayuma Sasaki. What a start. Got out in front. Now, he was the fastest man in practice. He had the race pace. And with uh, all the shenanigans, he ended up on pole. And that got away clean. Got a nice gap. But uh, about two-thirds of the race in... The BT commentator spotted it actually before I did. His gap in three sectors came down two and a half seconds. And then unfortunately we were shown the footage of him coming out of turn six. Where he lights the rear up, goes over the bars but lands back down. But it looks like his left knee kind of just went in between the frame of the bike and his fairing. And kind of propped a few rivets out and a few, probably I presume, torque screws or something like that. Blew him out anyway. And unfortunately his fairing was kind of half on. But it looks like... Now, I'd be interested to see what you thought of this race, but it looks like there was more issues than there was to meet TI originally with just his fairing. Yeah, it, it seemed a little bit weird because almost as if there was some sort of issue with the bike, and apparently during testing, that team were struggling with some issues with throttle delivery with the new electronic system that they're using this year. So it could have been something to do with that. Maybe even the high side itself was caused by... An issue we're not too sure i've not heard anything at this point maybe something will come out a little bit later because we're recording not too long after the motor gp race so perhaps once they've taken the bike apart and had a look they might be able to figure out if there was some issue but yeah it seemed like he was losing even more because of course he had a damaged fairing so he would be a little bit slower through the corners because there'd be a bit more the bike wouldn't handle quite correctly because obviously there'd be wind going underneath the, the fairing and of course he'd have more drag on the straight but he seemed to be really slow like he seemed to be almost at half the speed of the other riders so i think there was definitely some sort of mechanical problem as well it definitely didn't seem like it was purely just down to the to the fairing so i'm not really sure how he how that really happened i guess i guess it's something we'll just have to hope we find out but it did seem like a really really odd situation so moving on now to another one of the asian riders Suzuki got a penalty, as we mentioned previous, that he had a penalty from his qualifying performance. And obviously, at starting at the back, he's probably around some riders that he was a bit quicker than. But Forty came into the last corner, made a mistake, went for a bit of an overzealous move, got on the dirty part of the track, crashed, and unfortunately took down his old team, uh, took down Lorenzo Fallon into the final corner. So unfortunately, a penalty in qualifying and taking another rider out in the race. I have serious questions, and I think a lot of people who over Tatsuki Suzuki, whether he is will deserving mainly of that seat. That is probably the hottest seat, the layer powered Honda team in Moto3 over the last couple of seasons, bar maybe the IO team. But I think that might be due to the nationality Honda, Japanese Suzuki. I think that's where I see it, but... But does a lot of question marks and he seems to be very good over one lap but in the race he just has a few few moments where he just he looks like his brain just switches off he makes a few errors that are very costly and already two bigger errors in race one 
including the crash and the qualifying. So what is your uh, thoughts on Suzuki and how he's made the transition over to one of the biggest teams in Moto3? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, that one, because him getting the signing in the first place did kind of shock me. I think, like you say, I think there may have been some influence from Honda there, you know, get their, uh, basically the number one Honda team, the Leopard, it has been for the last few years, uh, probably the best team in Moto3. Again, like you say, other than probably Io, the, those two teams definitely pegging. I mean, even since like 2015, obviously those have been the two bikes really fighting for the title most years. So yeah, it was a little bit of a weird signing. And then he was making more mistakes. It's just something he's done throughout his whole career. I mean, back when he was on the 658 bike, he put it on pole, he'd be battling, he'd be leading for a bit, and he'd just he'd end up falling off. It was it was just a bit of a cliche. Both riders in that team at the time, really, could stick it on pole and just would end up crashing at some point. So it seems like he's carried on doing that because, I, I don't know, I guess it's just how, how he is. He just, like you say, he just kind of switches off and he, he makes these mistakes. But his initial start was pretty good. He was getting through the pack quite well. I think he was actually in front of Fodger when he fell off, although Fodger did have the extra long lap. But even still, I think he might have been ahead of him before that. So Suzuki's actual start coming back through the pack was pretty good, but... Yeah, he went for a bit of a move on full on, which it was a bit of a late move, bit of dirty part of the track. Just took the front, just wiped him out, and yeah, that was that was one of the contenders out the out of the race completely there because of, well, of course he was crashed, so he was never going to be able to fight for anything. But yeah, just another Suzuki mistake there. Sadly, just uh, seems like something he'll always he'll always do. So just to finish off with Moto Three, we'd have to cover with the final winner. So it ends up. Andrea Migno, Pope Migno as we like to call him, what a little uh, character that fella is. He's 26 now, he's getting on in this class. He's 26. not. Uh, I didn't realise he was that old. Oh. Yeah, at the, the start of the, the BT broadcast, Chiller Race, he had the um, Stars of Tomorrow and there was a picture of him and Gavin Emmett mentioned he's 26 now, so he is one of the senior riders in the Moto3, so I expect him probably next season, if he can have a good season this year, to move up to Moto2. Oh, yeah, we'll move on to Nico Antonelli in Moto2 in the VR46 team in a minute. But I reckon that could be a C for Mino in 2023. But Mino did everything right. What did you make of his performance? Yeah, it was, a, it was a great performance. I mean, throughout his career, he's shown sort of flashes of brilliance. Obviously, he only had that one win to his name. I think, was it Magello 2016 or was it 2017? I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but... He won that one race at Mugello and he's, he's been fighting at the front. Last year was a fairly decent season for him. He got quite unlucky, kept getting taken out, but he was he was always up there in the practice sessions, in the races. He was up there generally, crashed a few times himself. But yeah, this time he, he did it absolutely perfectly. Seems like they might have found a little bit in that Snipers team with the straight line speed performance because none of the KTMs could actually draft past him up towards the line. So he wasn't constantly having to fight too much and he... Yeah, he didn't put a foot wrong. I don't think I saw him making a single mistake or race. Great ride from Mino. Like you say, I think if he keeps this up, this performance throughout the season, I think he's definitely going to get a Moto2 ride. Obviously, there's, uh, there is that space in the, the VR46 team. And then there is, I mean, there's two VR46 teams now in Moto2. So you never know. And obviously, he could end up in a different team as well, not necessarily even VR46. So there's plenty of options there for Mino. Another a really good performance from him not really a lot to say just because he, he didn't do anything wrong he just he just did it all perfectly yeah so we're going to move on now to motor two um we're going to start with nico antonelli we're going to start at the back of the field last in qualifying came home in the race absolutely nowhere he was way out of the race so again he's another one of these riders he kind of a bit of the suzuki syndrome where i'm not really sure how he managed to get the seat. He was maybe 2015, he was the next big thing. He was kind of in the years of Vinales, the Fanatis. I know Fanatis only gone back to Moto 2 this year, but he was that kind of that age group coming up. And now does during like those people come up after him and now they're in GP winning and it's it's a bit weird to see how he's so long in Moto 3, was very quick, and then started, kind of lost his path and then looked like maybe he got it back a few times, but again. The fact when I saw him got announced for the VR46 team, again, big shot for me. Coming home at P26, so he was the last of the finishers battling for the last place with Zonta van der Gerberg and Sean Dylan Kelly. Two rookies also, but um, with the VR46 team, slightly more experienced than the American race team and RW racing. So you'd expect something a bit better from him, but uh, what's your thoughts on what's going on overall with Antonelli? 
it's, it's just another strange, bit of a strange ride, a bit like uh, with Suzuki, like you say, really. He's shown flashes of brilliance, and he has been in Mo he was in Moto3 for so, so long. To be honest, I was quite surprised he even got the Avintia seat last season, but I think he actually had quite a good last season in his defence, and he showed that he did deserve that seat. And yeah, maybe a Moto2 promotion, but he'd been in Moto3 for so, so long. I just thought at that point, there's no way he's, he's ever really leaving, because he never really had that last little bit. And when, yeah, he got announced for the VR46 team, it was a little bit weird because I was actually kind of expecting Mino to get that seat last year because of his pretty decent season himself and obviously being a little bit younger, although there's not actually a lot in it, I don't think, in terms of the age. But, yeah, Antonelli not really showing much form this weekend because, like you say, yeah, he was battling with two rookies, obviously Sean Dillon Kelly and Zonta, but I don't believe Sean Dillon Kelly or Zonta have ever ridden LaSalle at all before. So I think they were learning the circuit... Obviously, Antonelli knows that track pretty well. He's been around Grand Prix for a good 10 years or so now. Uh, again, it's a, it's a team he knows, you know, all the all the people he hangs out with on, you know, sort of on a daily basis. So a little bit less for him to learn. Not taking anything away from him in, in that aspect. I mean, still learning a Moto2 bike is hard, but he's an advantage compared to the other riders, I would say. And obviously, he lost out to them only just, but he, he did lose out to them. Qualified last, of course. Uh, but, you know, finishing last when the guy on the other side of the garage won the race pretty convincingly, it's a bit, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was an odd decision really to, to sign him, I thought, in the first place. And I guess we'll see how he gets on in this season, but definitely some question marks over him. Uh, it's, uh, the performance really just wasn't there this weekend. It, it was quite poor. To finish up with Anthony, he finished 56 seconds behind his teammate. And as we know, Mortal 2 is equal there's no favoritism of parts. That's that's the exact same bike. So 56 seconds in a 18, 19 lap races. Yeah, too is, many uh, laps, so it's a half a lap. Yeah, that's that's quite a lot. Like that's that is a big gap, considering some like Pedro Costa, the rookie, was 26 seconds behind after running off, and we'll come to that in a minute. The uh, the start of the race, but we're going to move on now to um, Philip Salich, another rookie, another rookie in the class but he had a stunning he was one of the riders in motor 3 that always looked a bit too big for a single cylinder 250 and it uh, was tipped to do good things on a bigger bike and he had a brilliant friday a brilliant saturday qualifying right up the grid unfortunately though in the race had a big high side and was briefly knocked out but after a minute or so looked to regain consciousness and kind of pick himself up so Reese, what do you think he can do in his rookie year after such a promising opening weekend? I think he can do really well. He really, really impressed me. Like, to be honest, I hadn't even thought about him at all really going into this season. Obviously, he, was, he wasn't too bad in Moto3. He had some flashes of brilliance. I think he got pole at Saxon Ring last year. And then, obviously, he left the Snipers team, moved over to Peru. Still was, wasn't too bad there. I think he did a couple of one-offs in Super Sport 300 at one point. It was pretty competitive. So... I know he was a fairly decent rider, but I didn't think he'd take to Moto2 in the way he did. But yeah, he's a very tall, tall guy. So I guess having that extra weight probably doesn't help in Moto3. But in Moto2, it, it, you know, it's not too bad. So it kind of does help you out a little bit. And yeah, he, he had a fantastic weekend. Obviously, unfortunately, he did crash in the race, but he qualified really well. Obviously, he had a bit of the, the nasty high side in the race. Definitely will have probably knocked his confidence a little bit. Obviously, he got knocked out, which again is not great. So hopefully... He should be okay for Mandalika. I mean, there is a week off, so in terms of the concussion protocol, he should be fine for that. But hopefully, he's feeling okay when it comes to that race. But yeah, rookie season. I think you know, well, based on the performance you could see, definitely expect to see a few top fives, maybe even a podium from him. I mean, just I know it's purely based on qualifying, but you know, that, that's you know, really, really impressive performance for the first race of the season. And yeah, hopefully, he can bounce back from this little crash and you know, have a have a good season, try and get some podiums. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, he will be one of the probably unfavoured riders for Rookie of the Year, but I definitely think he can challenge for some top 10s, at least some of the rounds this year. And uh be interesting to see, he's in a pretty decent team in the uh, Grassini Racing Motor 2 team, so a pretty high team. So I do expect, with all the years of experience they've had in that class and stuff like that, that they will push on and give him a platform to achieve some good results. But moving on now, we're on to Sam Lowe's. Now, Sam Lowe's had some issues in pre-season he has an issue with his right wrist i believe now he said it wasn't due to a crash it's due to that he has liquid building up in it and he starts to lose it's similar to 
palm pump, but it's in his wrist. He loses strength more than anything. Now, he said it isn't sore, but he says riding a motor two bike, it's quite physical, and he's an aggressive riding style. So he said he's having issues for more than a couple of laps. He basically loses. He starts to lose feeling his right hand, and that kind of gets a bit dangerous. Now, he's doing a lot of... Uh, kind of getting massages and kind of having ice packs on it in between races and laps and sessions so he's trying to get as much kind of care to his wrist as best as possible but now there might be rumours as well he could in between uh, round 2 and round 3 as we go to Indonesia and then to Argentina there is a bit of a gap there that he might try and squeeze in a surgery just to kind of get it sewn up and it's never ideal to get it done mid-season but uh, what do you think of Sam's first weekend with a, a dodgy wrist? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. So, of course, he's struggling quite a lot. He's got tendonitis, so it's, it's in his left wrist, I think. Oh. Uh, not rather than his right. But, yeah, he's, he's struggling quite a bit with it. You can get a surgery on it. I think there's a, an MX rider that's recently had it done. I think he was back on a bike within about 10 days. So, potentially, he could try and get it done between a couple of races. I don't think he'll get it done before Mandalika. And based on this weekend, he can still perform. So, for now, if he's managing it and obviously having massages on it between the sessions, like you say, and trying to rest it where he can and sort of skip days at the gym to not aggravate it too much, he could probably keep it under wraps a little bit for now. But it is one of those issues that it's a sort of like scar tissue inside, I believe, is the, what causes sort of the sensation to be lost in the arm. So the more it's irritated, I suppose, the more it kind of inflames and it becomes more of a problem. So you don't want to aggravate it too much. You do want to get sorted as soon as possible. But with such a an action-packed season. I mean, there's 21 rounds this season, most we've ever seen. Uh, there's not much of a break. I mean, like you say, perhaps there was rumours where you could do it between Mandalika and Argentina, but then, if not there, really, you're looking at the summer for, for a break long enough for that where he can come back and not miss any races because, of course, he doesn't want to miss any races, but it depends if the issue gets any worse. If it gets to a point where he's struggling and he can't really score highly, then it definitely would be worth missing a race, you know, lose a couple of points you could have got and then actually be able to fight for the rest of the season so it'll be interesting to see how it develops but yeah he had a pretty good weekend overall obviously just managed to get third at the last corner but we'll, we'll come on to that in a little bit but yeah it was a pretty decent weekend for him it should have been pole position of course one on the green that's his own fault but yeah good pace throughout managed to keep it going through through the race when it looked like he could be losing strength so yeah pretty good weekend there for sam just despite the issue yeah, and again, <laughs> back to with Sam, another issue is race control or race direction that they didn't, at the time, enjoying the session, they didn't take his lap away like they did for most people. So he said he had a bit more and he could have went quicker and he could have pushed on and went quicker and done a clean lap and taken pole. But because he was on pole and there was no question of whether he touched the green or not during the session, he kind of had sat on his laurels and ended up losing pole over it. But I feel Sam, he nearly always starts the season with some sort of niggly issue over the last since... 2020 every year you come in you go well he has this he has that so you just like to see a, a healthy sam to see what he can actually do over a full year and uh, unfortunately again he's gonna have to probably go under the knife before we go to europe if he wants to because soon as you get to europe especially with the like you said the longer season it's going to be manic trying to get anything done surgery ways to recover and not lose out three rounds because you're at 80 percent with a, a sewn up wrist but Moving on, now we're going to move on to the start of the race with Acosta, Algier and Dixon. Now, this was kind of a chain reaction from Acosta only in deep. He got pushed in by Algier and unfortunately Dixon was running wide. Acosta, I think, was the furthest wide running into the AstroTurf at touch. But uh, three riders that were actually at good pace and it would have been a lot of question marks over what they can do this year. And unfortunately, with the three of them kind of taking each other out of the fight for the front groups, we didn't really see much or pace So. Acosta rookie, Aldegar again is so young he might as well be a rookie and Dixon now in his third year I believe, fourth year I believe actually in the class so what do you make of them three, what can you see for them after round one? Yeah it was a little bit of a shame that that happened, uh, they kind of all got in hot sort of on their own but they kind of got in each other's way so I think Dixon was the leading of the, the three of them going into the corner, he got in a bit hot, I think Aldegar probably got sucked in by him, went in even wider uh, Acosta was sort of round the outside going wide himself anyway, but uh, Aldegar had to sort of pick up to avoid Dixon, which then made Acosta pick up and run even wider. So I think that's why Acosta ended up actually on the, the AstroTurf round the outside. And I think he dropped literally the last position. So not an ideal way to start his Moto2 career. Obviously, the two 16-year-olds, 
Aldegare, yeah, it's, it's kind of a rookie. He did about half a season last year, but I think technically he's not a rookie. I think he's done enough races to not be classed as one. But even still, two really young lads there. It'd be interesting to see how they get on. Hopefully they should be pretty strong. I mean, they were looking pretty good throughout all of the practice. So it is a bit of a shame that they ran wide because but ruined their races because it's not like Moto3. You can't get back through once you've uh, dropped behind. Obviously, we saw Acosta win from the pit lane last year at the same track, but Moto2 is a completely different kettle of fish. Everybody is... Well, everybody's fast in Moto3 as well, but everybody's even faster in Moto2 and the, the bikes, because they're so balanced, it's so difficult to find any time on anyone. Yeah, so they did struggle to get through, but I think Acosta... Acosta's recovery was pretty good. Aldeguer didn't re quite recover as well, but Dixon's recovery was the best, but then I suppose he lost the least positions compared to all the others. It is a bit of a make or break season for Dixon, because like you say, it is his fourth season in the class, but seems like on his return to the Aspar team, he's he's getting on pretty well. He's seen pretty quick all weekend, had a couple of little offs, but didn't seem to affect him too much because he qualified pretty well. Again, another victim of... Um, losing a lap although it wasn't his fault it was because of a yellow flag I think he probably would have started even higher up if he hadn't have got that and perhaps he wouldn't have ran wide into the first corner so a bit of a what if situation there but those three riders all seemed very quick this weekend so hopefully next weekend they won't well, well next race they they won't make the same mistake at the start and it'll be interesting to see how they get on hopefully they should be right at the front fighting for the top positions yeah Jay came home in p11 and Pedro was actually just behind him seven seconds further back and just outside the points for me and Alguer finished behind his teammate having a close battle half a second away from points so overall decent recovery rate from Dixon just under 19 seconds from the win from Cestino Vietti who we're going to move on to now who rode an impeccable race uh, Lorenzo like I said before the podcast race and he was just hit his marks apex to apex white line to white line what did you make of the, uh, the young Italian's performance? It was, it was just amazing. I mean, again, another rider that kind of caught me off guard. I knew he would be good this season. I did expect podium potentially a win throughout the season because he had a fairly decent rookie campaign, had had a few results here and there that were like, oh, that's pretty good. But he was he was fairly anonymous throughout, but it wasn't a bad... For, for a season as a rookie, he didn't do badly at all. It was fairly decent. So I was expecting him to sort of take that step a bit like all the rookies do into the next season, a bit like Arbolino has done as well because he was also pretty good in the race, but... Vietti just he cleared off put the bike on pole of course he qualified second until Sam got his lap took off him but either way he set the fastest legitimate lap time in the session so that's how it works started on pole position got the whole shot on he was absolutely gone I mean he was uh, about six seconds in front of Canet by the end so unbelievable not a foot wrong all race I don't think it even cuts him at one point like sort of having made a mistake like it usually does with a, a runaway leader it's just yeah it was just flawless like you say it was lorenzo star ride led from the front hitting all his marks perfect ride from vietti really 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 impressive i didn't actually quite see that coming but if he's got performance like that you know he he's definitely the favorite you know if he can continue that he's definitely favorite for the championship some of the other favorites not having such a good start and we've seen in previous years it's it's how many points you pick up at the start of the season that tends to decide it at the end you can be great for the second half of the season but if you scored no points or not m many points at the first round and you lose out by like 16 or something then th you know that's what made the difference so Vietti great start to the season really put himself there as a championship contender and yeah and you're bang on with your prediction of his time 6.1 seconds he was ahead of Aaron Canet and um I did have Vietti down as my dark horse but even that I didn't expect him to come out and do that that was a bit special and uh, second season in the class now, so he is still relatively new to the class. And I thought maybe every couple of rounds he might get himself on the podium or something, but geez, that was a splendid race for him. I really did not see that coming from him, but he was so perfect. I can't get across. Like, usually the Moto 2 class is a bit dull because it's the similar tech and everything. They can't really make the difference, but he cleared off. He was head and shoulders better than everyone else on the track. And a shout out result for Aaron Canet, new team are back on the Calyx now with the Flexbox HP40 team. So podium on his debut with the new team. So again, solid result for him. But to end off the motor two, we have to cover the last corner shenanigans between uh, Augusto Ramirez and Oya Gore. So coming into the last corner, Augusto Fernandez was in P3, Oya Gore was P4, and Sam Lowe's was P5. And across the line, it was Sam Lowe's P3, Augusto Fernandez P4, and Oyakura P6. 
why don't you uh, take us away with what happened in the final lap in the final corner? Oh, it's absolutely unbelievable. I, I still can't believe it. Uh, th that last corner was a little bit interesting through the race because um, there was a great save from Barry Baltus into that corner as well. He completely lost the front, put his hand down and sort of lifted himself back up. And it was it, kind of a similar thing here with Ayagora. He went for a pass on Augusto Fernandez down towards the last corner, which in hindsight he didn't really need to make because Fernandez went a little wide into the last corner himself. And I think... Agora probably would have squared off the corner better, maybe even got underneath him, but definitely would have outdragged him to the line. So it turned out to be a bit of a mistake, but kind of similar to what Suzuki did actually on uh, Falon. He went up the inside, dirty bit of the track, lost the front, and then just sort of skated straight into the side of Augusto Fernandez. Massive collision. It proper wrenched Ayagora around. His head really wrenched, but that sort of sat his bike back up, which saved him from crashing. Augusto Fernandez somehow didn't get knocked off by that massive clout into the back of his bike, but that just completely ruined his momentum. So Sam Lowe's just thank you very much because flying past. Obviously, Ayagora completely out of shape, goes completely off the track, loses all the positions, and Arbolino ends up getting in front of him. But lucky to stay on really for Agora, picked up some points. But yeah, what a crazy last corner and a, a podium for Sam Lowe's with his injury. So yeah, it was a it was a good way to end the race. It was very very chaotic right to the right to the death so yeah it was it was really really strange yeah and just a bit on Agora, i believe that he probably wanted to try and make a bit of a block pass into the final corner but augusto kind of went defensive and kind of overshot the corner so i reckon Agora thought that if he just released the brake and try and just take a bit of corner speed that he'd be able to get the momentum and drag him to the line but because of the extra he probably broke a bit late and tried to take corner speed that the front just went and they were both very lucky to stay on, but uh, Tony Arbolino and uh, Sam Lowe's, the both the Mark VDS boys, benefited big from that. So we're going to move on now to the MotoGP. We have a lot to cover. It was an action-packed weekend in MotoGP, and then we're going to start off with the nightmare weekend for the Factory GP22, so we're not going to cover the other ones till a bit later. So Jack Miller, Pekka Bagnaya, what an absolute disastrous round one. Yeah, absolutely unbelievable. I mean... You know your weekend's going badly when on the first day after the Friday people are asking whether you're sandbagging. It was just it was sort of dialing in the bikes. So it was really, really weird. So, so strange because they were super strong there last season. They were really, really strong coming into the season as well. So at the back end of last season, the Ducati was phenomenal. Jerez test, they were phenomenal. But it seemed like at both Sepang and Mandalika, they were struggling a little bit. And that seems to have been carried over to here. That they were they were absolutely nowhere all weekend. Really, Banyai and Miller and Banyai didn't qualify too badly. Did he qualify about sixth position, something like that? wasn't wasn't too bad. He was fairly up there, but yeah, in the race, just terrible. Obviously, Miller had some sort of weird problem. Uh, he retired. Not sure actually what what the retirement issue was, but he completely dropped to the back of the pack and then ended up pulling the pits. So obviously, some sort of mechanical failure there for Miller. And uh, obviously, Banyai's race didn't go to plan. Uh, I suppose that's one way of putting it, ending up in the gravel. But yeah, all weekend, the bike just didn't seem to have the pace. I mean, the, the factory boys, they've reverted to some different spec of the engine, sort of a hybrid between the GP21 and GP22 engine to do with the, the smoothness of the power delivery. So, so the, the Ducati, they're definitely struggling. Well, the, the factory Ducati, at least. We'll, uh, we'll talk about the other Ducatis in a little bit, but... Yeah, just not not a good weekend for Factory Ducati at all. Not the way being favourites going into the championship. You want to start zero points. Yeah, that's uh, it's going to be a tough pill for them to swallow. Just a bit on Jack there. He did have a lot of issues with ECU Gremlins during the Mandalika test. So he was still dialed. He never actually kind of really had a good full day of testing before the season. So maybe something from the test kind of came back to bite them in round one. So... So still, yes, nothing confirmed from Ducati, but he dropped right back, so that could be an ECU issue. But uh, we still don't know, just had to point that out, that he had a, a few of these issues in practice, or in pre-season as well. But moving on to one of the bigger surprises, actually, there's him and his brother, but we'll cover his brother later. Brad Binder, his weekend was phenomenal, topping FP1. Reese, how surprised were you by what the KTM managed in Qatar? I was, well, I was completely surprised. I mean, during the last season there was a few moments where they were decent but it was a pretty woeful season they were completely lost obviously they've uh resorted into this season bringing in a, a new team team manager obviously with the uh, guidotti so things definitely changing down in ktm and 
it didn't seem to particularly have made them much better in the test. Again, they seemed to be nowhere, even on time attack pace. They couldn't really get anywhere. The KTNs were struggling. They were right down the bottom of the time sheets in both Sepang and Mandalika. And again, it seemed to be going that way through FP1, really. that They weren't doing too well. But Binder, right near the end, sort of popped up right at the top. And yeah, he, he sort of secured his way into Q2 as well. And throughout the other three practice sessions, qualified really, really well, which has not been a strength for Brad Binder. I mean, I'd go even to say throughout his career, not even necessarily just in MotoGP. I don't think he's ever really been much of a qualifier. And yeah, I mean... That's all he's needed. He's been phen phenomenal in the races. So he got a good start after starting in a decent position. Brought home a fantastic result. But really, it seemed to be Binder making the difference. Because the other KTMs, of course, there's two rookies uh, on the KTM. So again, I guess you've got to take that into consideration. They're not going to be as good. But Oliveira didn't really seem to be able to match Binder. Um, I, I just realised now that I said I, th I thought they got straight through to Q2, but they didn't, did they? They went through Q1 because uh, Oliveira yeah. was following Binder around and Oliveira didn't manage even with that sort of toe. For, oh, P14 on the grid for yeah. Oliveira and then obviously Binder got straight through. Yeah, it wasn't uh, even following Binder. It wasn't enough for him to get through. So Oliveira not really been able to match Binder. So f for Brad Binder, great weekend. I mean, ending up on the podium, top of FP1. What a way to start the season for him on a... A bike that really didn't seem up to it. He absolutely nailed the launch as well. There is some overhead footage on the MotoGP uh, Twitter page. And he absolutely nails it into turn one. And he makes up a lot of time. But just for reference, uh, his teammate crashed out with uh, 12 laps to go. So he was still barely halfway through the race. And one point for Remy Gardner, P15. And Raul Fernandez was last. So again, two rookies, you can't expect much from them. Miguel Oliveira, he's been there now. He's been in the class, showing a lot of pace. But uh, again, he's going, he's going to have to have a strong season. There is rumours that he kind of wants out of that seat and would like to maybe jump to a different manufacturer. But that is um, a bit of a worry that KTM have they gone down the route of the old Honda mindset of having a bike that works really well for one rider because in his uh, post-race interview with Simon Crafer, uh, Brad Binder did say that he felt like he had so much confidence in the bike, he could do whatever he wanted, he could push the whole race. So, it is working for one of them. Unfortunately, the other three are a bit at sea. Obviously, the rookies will get there, but someone with the experience of Miguel Oliveira and the talent, you'd expect a lot more than crashing out with half race distance. We're going to move on now to Yamaha, another worrying day for Yamaha. In testing, all the murmurs that were coming out is that they haven't changed enough. Davi was saying it. Frankie kind of resisted. I think Frankie, a bit like Valentino, he didn't want to criticise the team in the public. That's not the way he'd go about it. But uh, Quattrara was really public with it. He was, every time he had the chance to slay Yamaha, he would saying that no power, very little change from last year's bike. I don't see any difference. We're going to struggle in Qatar, this, that, and the other. And Davi saying there's very, very little, there's minor changes. He said that we're not after making a step at all, not even half a step. So what do you see going forward for the Yamaha team after finishing P9 as a top rider in round one at the track that they've won most races since coming here in 2004? Yeah, it's just... It just continues for Yamaha. I mean, th throughout all the years, they've always asked for more power. But it seemed like towards the end of last season, it really was something they needed. And they just didn't deliver on it. It doesn't seem like they have any extra power. In fact, they have less straight line speed now because of the new fairing that they brought has a bit more drag. So they're even slower on the straights than they were previously. Everybody else has taken a good step forward. I mean, there's been a two-year engine freeze. So you'd think they would have made some sort of progress, but... It just doesn't seem like it. it. seems like they're struggling so much. And I think, like you say, obviously, Qatar has always been a bit of a Yamaha trap because, yes, there's the long straight, but then there's so many flowing sections to make the time up. And I think now it's got to the point where, yes, they are still the fastest bikes through the flowing section. They've not lost their strength. They are still significantly better than the other bikes through that area. But now they just lose too much time on the straights. If you're losing four tenths a lap at least on a straight every single lap, you're just going to start you're just gonna start dropping back and now the Yamaha because of that issue because they're losing four temps on the straight and they can't make it up in the twisty bits they don't start as high up the grid previously 
Quartararo's been able to win races by starting starting well, maybe dropping back to you know sixth or seventh at the start when the Ducatis go past him, but then he can still carry the speed and throughout the race he kind of picks them off one by one. He can get his way to the the front, or he can start from pole and sort of get the whole shot and end up winning like he did a few times last year. But like Silverstone and uh, well, he would have done at Jerez if he hadn't had the arm pump it, arm pump issue. And so. It just seems like now that they're, they're losing so much on the straights that they can't make it up in the corners anymore. And that is a, a serious, serious issue for Yamaha because, I mean, none of their riders are anywhere. Their best rider last year was Quattararo and he was miles ahead of all the other Yamahas then. I mean, Rossi was nowhere. Morbidelli was nowhere. Uh, obviously, Morbidelli had the issue, so that was part of the problem. But then when Dovi got on the bike, he was nowhere as well. And now it's even worse when your top rider is now eighth place again. The, the, the Yamaha riders were nowhere. Obviously, they've got a rookie, Darren Binder. So, to be fair, like we were saying with the KTM, can't judge him too much on his performance. But, obviously, he's not on a great bike anyway. Dovi was nowhere. Morbidelli was a bit quite far off the back of Quattararo again. And Quattararo only just managed ninth, just got pipped by Zarco. So, Yamaha are in serious trouble. Now, I still think once they get to a track like Jerez, for example, they'll still be pretty competitive. The straights, obviously, don't matter so much there. There is the long back straight down towards the Danny Pedrosa corner. But... That's about it, to be honest. And there's so much flow in like, the last sector. So I think a track like Jerez, they're going to do well. But looking at some of the tracks that are coming up, Mandalika, there's a couple of fairly flat-out sections there. They're going to lose a lot of time. Argentina, again, there's a long, long back straight. Austin, again, a few fairly long straights out of hairpin corners. So, yeah, Yamaha, they're, they're in a bit of a mess. I mean, they might end up winning a few races, but off this performance I don't know if they're going to, to win the title yeah and just the last corner Fabio came out ahead of Zarco and he ended up losing P8 to Zarco by seven thousandths of a second so drastic need to improve like Yamaha's way of working always when they had Jeremy Budgers and Rossi there back all them years ago and 20 years of this goes they always will win the battle between corner to corner, them short straights, they'd always be great out of the corner. But at this point now, they've gone backwards in so many ways that they're not even winning them battles. So they're literally corner speed is all they all they have at the moment. So and when you're behind a slower bike, as you said, like you're just not going to win races. For me, um my uh, Morelli was saying um can't think of his name now, the Yamaha team boss. Marigali. Marigali. He said that they have a new air affair in coming for about the fifth round, but like if they are P10 at best in Texas, Argentina, Mandalika, Polis Bargaro, Brad Binder, Mark Marcus could have 60 points over them. They ain't getting that back with a bike that can overtake. Fair enough, they might be ridiculously quick then in Mugello, Le Mans, Catalonia, and XYZ, but for me, this could be a, another 2018 season where. A public apology will come out at Austria. It's just, I think Yamaha as a whole in the GP category, I think championship last year really covered over the cracks. I think they're in a bad way and they have been ever since they switched to the kind of the one not one for all ECU in the class to Magnelli Morelli. Uh, Rossi always said that he had a brilliant bike. Yamaha was a great bike with their own in house ECU, but as soon as they went to that, they lost everything. And it looks like even now they won't be able to make the difference. Like with the riders, okay, Darren Binder, we'll come to him in a minute. He has had a lot of flak thrown at him for getting that right. Davi, uh, Razan Rosali came out at the end of last year saying that signing Rossi was a mistake. He was too old and it was like a, a farewell for him that year. Uh, Marbidelli still is not race fitness. He's still at about 90% over short runs. He still has the pace, but... All their hope is on the Frenchman, Fabio Quartararo, and it's getting to him. He's mentally... I watched him in FP4 and Q1 and in Q2, and there was three or four times where I saw him lose the front, get in hot into turn one, and especially another issue that I don't know, I don't think you mentioned, is the rear hole shot device isn't as optimized as the others. Every time he comes out of the final corner in FP4, when he it deployed it, it just started to tank slap, and as soon as that happens... The EC will start to cut power just trying to get it going and he'll have to drop throttle and you're going to lose acceleration and if on a bike that's slow already he's already going to be at a disadvantage so there's some 
flaws with the Yamaha at the moment that's going to need some serious work but we'll see come to Europe they're always strong in Europe and we'll uh, we'll go from there but we're going to move on now from one of the worst performances for Yamaha to an absolute masterclass from Grissini and A. Bastianini came into this year focusing he said on qualifying I have to qualify better he said that I have the race pace I can pass I'm confident on the bike getting the newer bike last year's um, won six races I think it won or seven races two with Jack and a couple with or five or so with Bagnaia but they have all the data from last year and he managed to qualify second behind the GP22 of Jorge Martin but what did you think of the absolute dominating performance from Bastianini in race one? Well, it, was, it was just amazing I mean I knew he was going to be good this year because last year he had some great performances obviously the two Masanas being the standout examples everyone goes to but for me I first noticed that he was doing a really good job in Aragon when he sort of carved his way through and then as well at Austin he also had a pretty good ride if I remember correctly so he, he he had some good performances towards the end of 2021 but yeah like you say qualifying was the area he really struggled with if you're starting 21st you're never going to win the race however when you start second you definitely can win the race as he showed today by breaking the Grassini the Grassini winning duck the first victory since Phillip Island 2006 from Marco Malandri for the Grassini team so that's uh that's it's been a long time for that team obviously they've been the Aprilia team for the last few years but even before that obviously they were a satellite Honda team for a long time and they never really came close to uh winning any races but Bastianini today just absolutely phenomenal the way he hunted down Paul Spagaro just to overtake him was just really really measured looked after the tires perfectly didn't get flustered when you know Brad Binder got in front of him for example he just sat there saved his tires like he'd sort of been doing in 2021 with those great performances where he came through it's just he started at the front so he had to use even less tire so absolutely phenomenal performance really really good weekend from saturday onwards i mean friday was a bit anonymous but good qualifying fantastic race yeah you can't really ask for much more leading the championship on a satellite bike and not even the second rate satellite bike a third rate satellite bike so it's it's, it's pretty impressive yeah, and of course, an absolutely incredibly emotional weekend for the Grassini family, as of course, we've unfortunately lost Fausto Grassini during the previous year with COVID. So very emotional. His wife was there and she was in tears, even with the race still going. Three laps ago, and she was already in tears. And it was very nice to see uh, Paolo Ciabatti and I think Gigi Delinia went into the Grassini garage to condole her as they won and congratulate her. But moving on now from Grassini onto Honda. Now, Honda have revolutionised their RC213V. Big changes to a lot to the front end. It looks like a bit of a Yamaha slash Ducati, the way they have the tail section and a quite a flat front with a different air intake and different wings. Now, in testing, all the people that were riding it, except Marquez, Mark Marquez, that is, everyone was saying, much better, bike has better balance, I'm not on the limit with the front end, I have rear grip better. Now, Marquez was kind of the one saying, I don't know the potential, I don't know what the front end is like. So he was kind of a bit pessimistic, you could say. And uh, he was very, very quick to point out in the pre-race conference that he won three races last year with that old bike. So it wasn't that bad. So kind of a, a sh firing a shot across at his Honda teammates that um, it was still a, a bike that could win races. But they got a great start. They led into turn one. 1-2 for a lot of the race. Mark is unfortunately kind of slid back. Now there's still question marks over his race fitness. First race since he won at um, Zano 2 when the championship was wrapped up for Fabio. So overall, pretty good weekend. What did you make of it for Honda starting out with a brand new bike? Well, it's very positive for them because obviously they're running 1-2 for a while, like you say. Paul, I mean, at one point it looked like he got the victory in the bag. Turned out he didn't, but podium for him that's pretty much as good as he got last year straight away i mean i know he finished second of course in masano but in terms of being the lead rider as well because he beat marquez that's got to be about the first time he's done that like in, for a good position at least perhaps he's beaten when they were both quite far down the order but yeah i mean he's the lead honda in the championship just it's looking pretty good for the bike to be honest because qatar's not particularly a track where they've gone well before obviously marquez yes he's battled with Dovi there a few times but that's not really the Honda going well that's sort of Marquez I mean the races where Marquez used to battle with Dovi were the races where the Honda didn't work because he wasn't miles up the road basically so 
yeah, it was uh, really interesting to see how good the Honda was straight out the gates. Obviously, it's still got to get dialed in. Completely different bike, so I'm assuming most of the old data is completely irrelevant. It is a little bit interesting to see how Marquez probably isn't quite 100% comfortable with the bike. I think... I almost feel like maybe it has too much rear grip for Marquez now because throughout his career, he's always skated that rear end. You know, if you look back to his Moto two days all the way through Moto GP, so potentially that could be some issue. But that's just a theory I have. There's not really any sort of evidence to back that up. I just see that obviously the the rear is not breaking traction like it used to. So perhaps that's why he's struggling again. Like you say, maybe some of the physical fitness. I suppose we'll find out. I mean, it could just be that Paul was quicker on the day. I mean, it's fully possible Paul is a very quick rider. So. You know, it just uh, was a little bit odd to see Marquez not being the lead Honda for once. But yeah, Honda, the bike seems to be working pretty well. So yeah, it's, it's got to be good for them going into some weirder tracks as well. Especially they've got Austin coming up soon, which is a Marquez track. So they could, there definitely is going to be a win or two there for Honda at some point. Yeah, and obviously Paul coming home on the podium, Marquez P5. And Nakagami coming home with P10. So three Hondas in the top 10, all within 10 seconds of the win thereabouts. And unfortunately, Alex Marquez did tip off at turn one, I believe, with 13 laps ago. So one of the bigger issues, I reckon Marquez especially will feel, I don't think it'll affect the others as much. A, rear, a bike with rear grip, a lot more rear grip, will end up pushing the front more. So where Marquez is incredibly strong was pushing the front in. So now he probably has a bit of a dilemma where he can't push the front as much, so he might have to kind of reinvent his riding style, but there's no doubt he will um, come out with some sort of ideas of riding around the issues that he's having with the current bike, and I expect when we get to Texas, Saxony, that we will see what he can really do with that bike. But we're moving on now to Suzuki. Now, Suzuki had a fantastic day one. Everyone was blown out of the water, especially in FP2 when... It was Rins who overtook a Ducati on a straight. Now, that has never happened in the history of MotoGP, a Ducati being overtaken by a Suzuki. Now, the whole concept of this is they've improved their engine, so they have a bit more horsepower. But their biggest thing is they've kind of reworked their whole shot device. So the bike sits down better, it is more optimized, gets lower, and they've reworked their wings. When the bike is lower, the lower arrow under the bike, more air going over the wings, it pushes the bike down. And they're reckoning at the top end, so just at the end of the straight, they've gained about 30 horsepower in their kind of aero drag system. Not actual mechanical, more aero, that's how much the bike pushes forward extra. So they are looking really good on the straights. Now, unfortunately, in Saturday's qualifying, there was a headwind, so they did get affected by the Ducati. Still managed to push through a bit further, and they managed to qualify a bit further down. Now, they did a good start, but uh, what did you make of overall the Suzuki race? I felt it was a bit average, but I'd... good to see what your thoughts would be. Yeah, it was a little bit disappointing, actually, the race, because of just how good Friday was. Like you say, I mean, I think it was Digi Antonio that Rins overtook, and Digi did a double take, like, to see, was that really a Suzuki that was blasted past me? It was unbelievable. So it seems like whatever they've done with the ride height device, the aero, seems to really work out. I mean, there's, people have said in the past that the Suzuki was always a bit like a not quite as good Yamaha, but now I think the Yamaha's not a, not a very good Suzuki, I think more so because obviously the Suzuki still turns they've not they've not lost that by obviously improving uh, I'm sure they've improved the engine as well to a certain extent so they've not lost that they've got some decent top end but yeah Saturday and Sunday were a little bit uh, underwhelming Saturday actually wasn't too bad because if you look at where they were qualifying last year it was woeful whereas this uh, this qualifying session they qualified fairly fairly well fairly representatively and the the start of the race was quite good Mir initially making some good moves it just seemed like they just sort of dropped back as the race went on. It just seemed like the bikes with the higher top end speed could just pull away. I don't know whether maybe Suzuki struggled with a little bit of tyre wear, but that's not usually something that Suzuki struggles with. Suzuki's usually very good on the tyres, so it was a little bit weird to see them struggle through the race. And like you say, it was a it was a bit average, but maybe that's just because of how good Friday was. Perhaps if uh, you know if they hadn't have had that Friday, we'd be saying, well, the Suzuki qualified pretty well. They finished you know not too badly. It's a good start to the season for them. So. Yeah, maybe we just got our hopes a little bit too high with some speed trap times, but yeah, it's a, the race did feel a little bit average. Yeah, and I think maybe, again, a new engine for Suzuki, it's great testing and stuff, but you never really find out where the bike is until they've done a full race, and Qatar is always one of those races that it's it's um, it's never, the form book doesn't really come into it. 
how they finished in round one is never going to be like what they're like when they get to Austria or to Mizano. It's always going to be a bit of a a different result. So maybe the new engine is a bit more effect, gets a bit more uh, wear on the tyres as the race goes on. Maybe there could be a bit of fuel consumption issues now. There's a lot of things that could be going wrong, but I do reckon that if they can get it just a bit more, just a bit tidier in the race trim, that they could have a really good season. And I'd say it was the first time that the two Suzuki's were in qualifying two for the first time in a long time. Usually one of them was starting 16th and maybe the other 11th or 12th. So for them to be qualifying well is a good part. Even if they lose a small bit of the race pace, if they can start third and fifth, they can hold back at start instead of trying to pass six Ducatis to get to the top five. So promising weekend, but in the race, they just kind of were a bit below or like, where I thought they could have done. But we're going to move on now to our final topic, and it's a shout out for Darren Binder. Now, poor old Darren Binder had a contract to move off to Moto 2 into Patronus team last year, and with the team pulling out, he had a contract. It all got messy, the courts were involved, and he was given a one year contract with Yamaha, even though a lot of people didn't like the idea of him going straight up because he wasn't a top Moto 3 rider. He had won races, but he was very aggressive. Had a lot of issues with other riders with um, collisions and may causing mayhem with his moves. Dive on Darren, as they call him. But I must say, I'm delighted that he's had a good round. He finished in P16. He was just behind Ozzy Remy Gardner, and he was just, what was a gap? Uh, not much. Just towards the end of the race, he just slipped back, and unfortunately, <laughs> not even I'd say he must got out dragged to the line because on my timing screen here says that it was a quarter of a tent that he lost out so I'd say similar to Zarco and Quattararo I'd say KTM probably just blasted him to the line so what did you make of Darren's debut in the GP class yeah I mean I'll be the first to admit I was one of those people that was saying that I didn't think he deserved the ride and it, you know it was a bit bit of a weird choice for them to make and obviously it was to do with the contract from before but to be honest, his race was very, very good. I was quite impressed by him. I think the commentators were saying as well they were fairly impressed by him because we've discussed at length already about how the Yamaha was not good at this track at all. So out of the rookies for this circuit, he was probably on the worst bike. And yeah, I mean, if we're being real, his, sat his Friday and Saturday weren't really... They were kind of what I expected. They weren't really great. But in the race, he was uh, he was doing really well. I mean, he was in front of Dovi at one point. I think he was even in front of Vinales at one point as well. So he was mixing it up with some experienced MotoGP riders, obviously Dovi being on the same bike as well, so that's uh, it's even better. And uh, then obviously he was top rookie then for most of the race after Marco Bezzecchi fell off, and then unfortunately to just get pipped by Remy Gardner to the line, but I think he can sort of stand up proud, obviously he's loving life riding the MotoGP bike, really enjoying himself, and you know what, he hasn't made a fool of himself, he's, he's beat the other rookies, obviously aside from Gardner, but he only just got beat by Gardner, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to say that I was wrong about it. I said that, I think, in my predictions video that uh, I'd be happy to be proven wrong about Darren Binder. And in this case, at least for the first round, yeah, it definitely seems like. It seems like he's, yeah, it was just a good race. Top rookie, really. I mean, he, yeah, he just got beat by Gardner. But overall, for the actual race performance, it probably was a better one. Yeah, I am, I am very happy for him because... At no fault of his own, he's been throwing all this flack and all these things have been said about him. And, like, he's done nothing wrong other than take a few people at Moto3. But just on the fair base that he has the right now, and a lot of people think that he'd ha that he's going to end up getting tossed out before he can even get a time on the bike, like uh, Sam Lowe's at Aprilia. By the time they got to Texas, Sam Lowe's was announced that he was already out of a ride and he had done a couple of pre-season tests and two races. So I hope for the Yamaha's sake to give him the benefit of the doubt maybe give him to Asin. now of course we have a, a Turkish rider by the name of Top Rack uh, riding an R1 at Superbike doing some pretty special things so he said he wants a factory bike so that might just keep Darren's position a bit safe now we will all expect Davi to have one year all the rumours coming out that he's come back up from sabbatical and that all the murmurs coming out of the place he's not happy with the Yamaha and so I reckon we won't see Andrea Davizioso on the 2023 grid. So that will instantly free up one spot with Yamaha. But uh, with the likes of Rod Fernandez not being too particularly happy on the KTM. Even though Yamaha looked pretty average, there's still a rake of riders that are willing to jump on either seat. So 
it's interesting to see how this develops as the season goes on, but I really hope that Darren Binder can progress from here with uh, some strong results as he wasn't. He finished only a couple of positions behind his much more experienced teammate, so quite good. I'm happy he had that result. He needed it to kind of shut up a few people, and he's managed to do it. So that has been episode one of the MotoGP Extra podcast. Now, of course, we will be back for round two in two weeks' time. We will be coming from Indonesia. So what are your uh, thoughts, quick thoughts about the GP class for Indonesia? Who needs to improve and who needs to... Uh, Who's going to have a strong weekend there? Well, it'd be tough to say who's going to have a strong weekend just based on the fact that it's obviously a new track, so it's unknown. But if I had to guess, probably Marquez because he's always good in tricky conditions. The the tarmac, by the sounds of it, was in a very, very poor condition when it came to the preseason testing. So I imagine that Marquez will sort of get along with that. He always gets along with his low grip. In terms of people that need to improve, obviously, like we said, Yamaha needs to try and improve a little bit there. I mean, the Ducati as well, the GP22, they need to also try and do a little bit better because, I mean, the factory team has scored nothing. I mean, the only, the top scorer, obviously, for the 2022 bike was Zarco, and he was the only scorer. Uh, no, actually, of course, Marini's on it, but he, yeah, he was the top scorer on the 2022 bike. So, yeah, they definitely need to improve. Yamaha need to improve. So, it'll be an interesting weekend in Mandalika because, of course, we don't know who the track is going to favour. But, yeah, I expect that uh, Marquez will probably be one of the riders to beat. What about you? What do you uh, think about going into this uh, weekend? I have fears for the track because of what happened, as you mentioned, in pre-season with the track being thrown up. Now, there has been comments from Chaz Davis, World Super, ex-World Superbike uh, rider, that they had all the same issues when Superbikes came here and they were told, yeah, it'll be done, this, that, and the other. Now, the issue is, is whatever they whatever the actual core material that they use is wrong for the part of the world that they're in. So the high humidity heat, it doesn't really work. So they need a slightly different kind of compound of track. And usually when a track is laid, it needs six months to set, like a good cake, it needs to leave and set. Now we're coming there four weeks after it's been redone. So really, it's, it's in turn one. It's not like it's a slower hairpin that you're coming in in second gear. You're coming into it about 170, 180 at least on a GP bike. So it's going to get a lot of flack. And I just have my concerns that it might be a bit too too much too soon. But I definitely think Ducatis will show strong there because there is it's a lot of heavy braking and accelerating for slower corners. I fear for Yamaha. I don't think Yamaha will do much there. But I think Ducatis will bounce back. But uh, saying that, you wouldn't have predicted that Ducati would have done what they did at Qatar either. So it's all unknown. It is the joys of modern day MotoGP. Nobody knows what's going on. It could be an absolute brilliant cat for KTM, but we don't know. So, yeah. Anything else to add before we finish it off? No, I think that's about it. I think we've covered everything there. Obviously, quite a lot to cover for the first race of the season. I suppose that's always what you're going to get. First few rounds are going to be probably a bit more bit more to say because obviously everything's still quite new until we get into Europe and kind of see what's going on there but yeah that's uh that's pretty much that it. is about it yeah so we are going to end today if you are watching on YouTube feel free to comment some of your own uh, opinions on the races from Qatar down below we will link both channels and if you are listening on Spotify I am Dill469 on YouTube and Reese is Biker Gaming on YouTube so feel free to come over and check out the channels but I think we will leave it there. We've rambled on for an hour. I think we've wasted enough of people's time. So we should see you all in two weeks' time from Mandalika. Bye-bye.